The Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recess of the subcommittee at any time. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on two bills, H.R. 1208 and H.R. 6180. Under Committee Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the Chairman and the Ranking Minority Member. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted in accordance with Committee Rule 3.0. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, and the gentlewoman from Minnesota, Ms. McCollum, be allowed to sit and participate in today's hearing. Without objection, so ordered. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, the subcommittee is meeting to consider two bills. These two bills center on the issue raised in the 2009 Supreme Court decision, Carcieri versus Salazar. In that decision, the Supreme Court ruled that the Secretary of the Interior, or Secretary, is only authorized to place land into trust for federally recognized tribes that can show that they were under, quote, federal jurisdiction when the Indian Reorganization Act, or IRA, became law in 1934. First, we have H.R. 1208, introduced by Congressman Cole, which would amend the Act of June 18, 1934, the Indian Re Re Reorganization Act, to grant the Secretary the ability to place lands into trust for the benefit of any federally recognized tribe. This legislation would essentially resolve the decision of Carcieri versus Salazar, removing the precursor of, quote, being under federal jurisdiction when the IRA became law on June 18, 1934. The second bill on the docket is H.R. 6180, introduced by Congresswoman McCarl, which would treat the porch band of Creek Indians as covered by the IRA and reaffirm any lands previously taken into trust for their benefit by the Secretary. The porch band of Creek Indians currently reside roughly 66, 56 miles north of Mobile, Alabama. A segment of the original Creek Nation, the Porch Band received federal recognition in August of 1984 th through the BIA's administrative process. After recognition, the Secretary placed land into trust for the benefit of the Porch Band under the IRA. This was, of course, prior to the Carcieri versus Salazar decision, which has left the Porch Band in limbo as a tribe recognized after 1934 with land in trust status. The porch ban has overcome time-consuming and costly litigation. In 2016, the U.S. 11th Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the tribe's reservation was protected under the IRA. However, this decision does not protect the porch ban from further litigation on any future parcels of land taken into trust by the Secretary for their benefit. As this subcommittee has seen, the ability to have land placed into trust is a top priority for many tribes and garners wide support across the board. Yet there are impacts to local towns, cities, counties, and states that should be weighed by the Department of Interior when placing land into trust. When the Secretary places land into trust, it is removed from local control and falls under federal and tribal control. This change often has implications for taxation, zoning, and other local or state laws regarding property. As seen with the porch ban, these implications can lead to litigation, which is often time consuming and costly for all of the parties involved. I'm hopeful that conversations, conversations such as the one we will have today will be a catalyst for a long-term solution across the board. I want to take the time to thank our witnesses for being here today, and I look forward to a robust conversation. The chair now rec recognizes the ranking minority member for her statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you for holding this hearing. And you can see the interest. We have standing room only. Uh, and it is because it is such an important issue. On December 2nd, 2021, I went to the floor with this very same bill as chair of the Subcommittee on Indigenous Peoples. And it was important to raise then, as it has been important to raise every time we reintroduce this bill since that fateful Supreme Court decision. That bill passed overwhelmingly, and I look forward to us moving this bill as well through this Congress because it is such a bipartisan effort to address this 2009 Supreme Court ruling in Carcieri. In Carcieri, as we have heard, the Supreme Court decided that under the IRA, the Secretary could take land into trust only for those tribes that were under federal jurisdiction in 1934. That decision was harmful. 
It was disrespectful to tribes. It essentially said that if you were not recognized, federally recognized, it didn't matter how long you existed, but if we hadn't done our homework and not right, made all the mistakes that we've made over the years, then you didn't get to reestablish your homelands. The ability to take land into trust is essential for tribes to provide housing, economic development opportunities, governmental services, and to protect tribal lands and cultural resources. The Cartier ruling upended 75 years of federal Indian policy and administrative practices. It created uncertainty. Because of Cartier, tribes have had to defend themselves in court, as we've just heard that Port Grand Port, the Port Creek Bandits had to do. DOI has to provide time-consuming and often unnecessary reviews of a tribe's jurisdictional status. And these are exactly the kinds of unnecessary and costly steps we should address. And that's what HR 1208 does. I want to thank both Representatives Cole and McCullum for their leadership on HR 1208 and for their years of leadership on this. I am an original co-sponsor of the bill. Their bipartisan work to correct the misguided Cartier ruling demonstrates how de Democrats and Republicans can work together on this subcommittee for Indian country. Mr. Cole's bill would simply restore the Secretary of Interior's authority to take land into trust for all tribes, regardless of their date of federal recognition. Let's be clear, H.R. 1208 is separate from Indian gaming law and does not alter the process for placing land into trust for gaming. It does not take away state and local government's input under existing Department of Interior's land into trust policies. H.R. 1208 just makes sure there is parity and equality for all tribes so they can fully realize the benefits of sovereignty, including through acquisition of trust land. That means we would not have to act, enact individual bills to return land that the U.S. government systemically removed from tribes. Bills like Representative Carl's H.R. 6180, which reaffirms the trust status of the lands of the Porch Band of Creek Indians in Alabama. Porch Band of Creek Indians, I apologize for the inversion earlier. Um, I believe that we need a clean Cartier fix. In the 117th Congress, we had a hearing like this. We passed it out of the floor uh, 302 to 127, just like we did in the 116th Congress. Congress has introduced legislation for Cartier in every Congress since 2009, and I want to thank once again uh, the chairwoman and the chair for allowing this hearing to go forward so that we can continue that tradition and finally get it over the finish line. H.R. 1208 isn't a quick fix, as some have said. Tribes, Congress, and the Department of Interior have worked on it for over a decade. It's past time to do the right thing for Indian country. It's our role in Congress to pass legislation to uphold our treaty obligations and trust responsibility to tribes. That's how we promote tribal self-determination and self-governance. Chairwoman Bryce, I truly appreciated your testimony, your witness, uh, your written testimony where you said, we receive blessings and blessings we give back. And I think that is so essential to how we look at what we are doing here today. I hope we can put politics aside and move this bill through the committee swiftly and to the floor so we do not need individual bills. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Chairman Westerman for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here today. And as the, um, the subcommittee chair and the ranking member stated, um, we're here to look at two different bills, really two different approaches um, that would amend the Indian Reorganization Act to address the 2009 Supreme Court decision, uh, Carcieri versus Salazar. And there is tremendous interest in this, and it's, I think it's appropriate that we have a hearing and if you look at the way this hearing structured, there's two pathways. Uh, one bill that would do a broad Cartier fix and another bill that would do kind of a more singled out approach. Um, and going forward, one way would kind of 
relieve Congress from having to deal with it in the future. The other way would be uh, individual fixes going forward. So I think it's good that we have, uh, have this hearing to bring out differences in the way to address Cartieri and to hear the, the concerns and to figure out what's best for our country going forward and for all the tribes involved. H.R. 1208, sponsored by Representative Cole, would amend the Indian Reorganization Act to clarify that the Secretary of the Interior has discretionary authority to place land into trust for any federally recognized tribes. Currently, a tribe must be determined to have been under federal jurisdiction on June 18, 1934, for the Secretary to take land into trust through the agency's administrative process. H.R. 6180, sponsored by Representative Carl, would also amend the Indian Reorganization Act to confirm the Secretary's discretionary authority to place land into trust for the Porch Band of Creek Indians, both for land already in trust and future parcels that the tribe could request the Secretary to take into trust. Tribes place land into trust for many purposes, including for tribal housing, economic development projects, and cultural and ecological conservation. The trust status gives tribes confidence that lands will not be transferred without federal action. This means tribal homelands that another tribal, that anchor tribal histories and stories remain a part of their future as well as their past. This committee has worked to pass various land into trust legislation on a consistent bipartisan basis, recognizing that tribes know what benefits their tribal members best. However, tribal trust land can have implica implications for local and state taxation, zoning, and other laws regarding property. Broad consensus between tribal, state, and local stakeholders on those issues and on those actions are crucial. It not only preserves support for placing land into trust, but also benefits any further development or use of the land. We've seen many examples of local communities benefiting from tribal development of trust lands diversifying economies and often providing jobs. We've also seen inst instances where tribes and local stakeholders are not on the same page, resulting in costly and lengthy litigation. While consensus can all, cannot always be reached, it is vitally important that we attempt to find the best way forward for everyone. This includes hearing from multiple perspectives on this issue and how all stakeholders would be affected if either of these bills became law. Congress has both plenary power over federal Indian policy as well as the uh, innate authority to define how we delegate power to administrative agencies. Ultimately, Congress can change policies and procedures if we think it is in the nation's best interest. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here to provide your expertise and testimony on these bills and on this important topic, and I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Westerman. Um, the votes have just been called. I am going to go ahead and introduce our witnesses, and then we will adjourn for a short period of time to allow us to go vote, and then we will come back and continue with the hearing. I'm sorry for the disruption, but we have two different vote series today, so we have to have one of them this morning. Very quickly, uh, I now want to introduce the witnesses for our panel. Ms. Catherine isom claus the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, U.S. Department of Interior in Washington, D.C. The Honorable Marshall Pure, Chairman, Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana, Marksville, Louisiana. And the Chair now recognizes Mr. Carl for one minute to introduce the witness from his district. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Madam Chairman. This is going to be a confusing day, I can tell already. I am so pleased to introduce uh, Chairwoman Bryant. It's truly an honor to have you here today. I haven't had a chance to speak to you yet. Hopefully you'll hang around a little while. Your leadership, uh, both on the Tribal Council and as a tribe CEO, demonstrates your dedication to improving the lives of the tribal citizens and their families. Your efforts benefit not only your community, but also contribute significantly to the well-being and the prospering of the state of Alabama, and we appreciate that. We truly do. We've worked on so many things together. I feel like we're brother and sister. Your leadership ensures that the voice of the Indian country are heard and that necessary means are taken to safeguard native-owned lands and uphold tribal rights. Your presence here to support this important bill highlights the tribe's commitment to economic growth and prosperity for both the Ports Nation 
and for all the nations. Thank you for the tribe uh, tireless effort and dedication to make a positive impact on our state economy and lives of the residency. I think that's it. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Carl. Our final witness of the day is the Honorable David Rabbit, District 2 Supervisor, Sonoma County Board of Supervisors, Sonoma, California. Go ahead and have to his five minutes or should we head over to the right? We're going to go ahead and take our recess now. And when we come back, we will have Mr. Carl introduce his bill and then we will go directly to the witness statements. Thank you. Committee is adjourned. Uh, or recessed, excuse me, not adjourned. The, the committee is in recess until we finish with our voting, which should probably be about a half an hour, I believe. Thank you. The hearing of the Subcommittee on Indian and Insular Affairs will come back into session, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Carl from Alabama for five minutes to speak on his legislation. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My bill is pretty simple the Porch Ban of Creek Indians Land Act is bipartisan, bicameral, efforts aimed to supporting the Porch Creek Band of Creek Indians, allowing them to exercise their sovereignty for the benefit of future generations. This act is not just about legitimately le legitimizing it is about enabling the tribe to provide essential government services effective to the citizens. By clarifying and reaffirming the tribe's rights under the Indian Reorganization Act, IRA, this bill will provide stability and a clear path forwards for their community development. The tribe, a federal recognized entity based in Atmore, Alabama, with over 2,700 excuse me, citizens, has limited trust lands, hindering the community's growth. This legislation ensures that the IRA applies to the tribe, enhances their ability to improve essential government services, and treating them on par with other federal recognized tribes. This bill is not only about supporting the tribe, but it's also about the potential to boost Alabama economy by generating new revenue and creating thousands of jobs. The Porch Ban Creek Indian Land Act affirms, uh, or excuse me, it, it aims at reaffirming the tribe's longstanding trust land and brings parties under the IRA. Since 2009, the tribe has faced constant litigation over the trust land. Stalled critical developments in housing, health care, and essential services. This legislation will ensure that the tribe is treated equal and with other federal recognized uh, tribes, allowing them better to better provide for their community. The widespread support for this bill at both local and federal level underscores its importance. Local governments, including Elmore County Commission, Scambia County Commission, Montgomery County Commission, and others have rallied behind this bill highlighting the collaboration spirit that is unified, backing, driving it forwards. This month, the Senate received, uh, received a hearing on this revision of this bill sponsored by Senator Katie Britt, which was a positive response, further demonstrating the bill's board appeal and significance. With that, Madam Chair, I return my time. Thank you, Mr. Carl. We will now turn towards witness testimony. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but your entire statements will appear in the hearing record. To begin your testimony, please press the talk button on the microphone, and we use timing lights. When you begin, the light will turn green. When you have one minute left, the light will turn yellow, and at the end of five minutes, the light will turn red, and I will ask you to please complete your statement. I will allow all witnesses on the panel to testify before member questioning. The chair now recognizes Ms. Catherine Isomclaus for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Hageman, Ranking Member Ledger Fernandez, members of the subcommittee. My name is Catherine Isomclaus, and I am Taos Pueblo. I serve as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy and Economic Development at Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. 
Thank you for the opportunity to present testimony on two bills before the subcommittee today. Restoring tribal homelands is one of the administration's highest priorities. This administration has repeatedly stressed the importance of and need for a Kacheri fix. Since the FY 2022 budget request, the president has proposed a sensible fix to treat all tribes equally in exercising the fundamental responsibility of placing land into trust for tribes. The Kacheri v. Salazar decision upset the settled expectations of both the department and Indian country and led to confusion about the scope of the secretary's authority to acquire land and trust for all federally recognized tribes. As many tribe leaders have noted, the Kacheri decision is contrary to existing congressional policy and subjects federally recognized tribes to unequal treatment under federal law. Since the Kacheri decision, the department must examine whether each tribe seeking to have land acquired in trust under the Indian Reorganization Act, or IRA, was under federal jurisdiction in 1934. This analysis is done on a tribe-by-tribe -tribe basis, even for those tribes whose jurisdictional status is unquestioned. This analysis is time-consuming and costly for tribes and the department. The Kacheri decision makes it likely that the department will face costly and complex litigation over whether applicant tribes were under federal jurisdiction in 1934. Overall, it has made the department's consideration of FEDA trust applications more complex and created additional burdens. <coughs> H.R. 6180 would address the impact that the Kacheri decision has had on the Porch Band of Creek Indians by ensuring that the tribe has the ability to restore and protect their tribal homelands under the IRA. H.R. 1208 would be a universal legislative solution to the Kacheri decision for all tribes. The language is identical to the proposal contained in the President's budget request for several years. This language would clarify Congress's intention in enacting the IRA, the acquisition of land in a trust for all tribes. The department supports H.R. 6180 and H.R. 1208. Tribal homelands are at the heart of tribal sovereignty, self-determination, and self-governance. The ability to restore and protect tribal homelands is an important part of our trust responsibility and has been the policy of the United, St of the United States for nearly a full century. The department urges Congress to enact a legislative fix to the Kacheri decision for all tribes to eliminate the need for each tribe to seek separate legislation. Chair Hageman, Ranking Member Ledger Fernandez, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide the department's views on these important bills, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. I'm going to go a little bit out of order, and I am going to recognize Mr. Quill from Oklahoma for five minutes to speak on his legislation. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Ledger Fernandez. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in this hearing room where I spent a lot of years earlier in my career. So. I want to thank the subcommittee for all its hard work on behalf of Indian Country, and particularly today for holding this hearing on my legislation, H.R. 1208, which would amend the Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 and affirm the authority of the Secretary of the Interior to take land into trust for Indian tribes. As many of you know, I've been a champion on this issue for the past 15 years since the Supreme Court's 2009 Carcieri versus Salazar decision. Uh, as an enrolled member of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma, I cannot overstate the importance of tribal sovereignty and the relationships that members of tribes have with their land, their identity, and their culture. Unfortunately, many were forcibly removed to unknown areas after the Indian Removal Act, which often resulted in residing in lands uh, that provided no opportunity to prosper. However, trust land does offer tribes the ability to expand economic development and provide for their people. Tribes use land and trust to build schools, housing, and health centers in their communities. In fact, in some rural areas, tribal nations are often the largest employers and health service providers uh, in the community. That's certainly true in vast stretches of my district. Tribes also rely on their trust land to produce both renewable and conventional energy, uh, as well as use the land for agriculture and uh, production of various types. In addition, trust land allows tribes to provide essential government services like tribal police and courts. However, in 2009, the Supreme Court uh, uprooted 70 years of precedent and turned the entire notion of tribal sovereignty on its head when it ruled that the Indian Reorganization Act questioned the authority for the Secretary of the Interior to take land into trust because the court interpreted the statute as only applying to the tribes under federal recognition when the law was enacted in 1934. 
This decision created two different classes of Indian tribes, those that can have land into trust and those who cannot. Uh, this two-class system is, determinal, or is detrimental uh, to so many Native communities, uh, as it excludes so many of them from exercising their legal right to act as a sovereign nation and deal directly with the United States on a government-to-government -government basis. This decision by the court makes it harder for tribes to manage and expand their territory, as well as uh, putting millions of dollars worth of trust land in legal limbo. This is simply unacceptable. Congress has long passed uh, over, uh, over, overdue to correct the law as the Supreme Court interpreted it when the court made the carcieri decision. Without a legislative fix, tribes' financial resources and, uh, will be drained and uh, spent on litigation and disputes between tribes and state and local governments. However, those arguing against the legislative fix claim that this is all about gaming. Let me be clear, this is false. In fact, out of the 961 total pending fee-to-trust applications, only 26 are gaming applications. And out of the 4,349 approved applications from 2009 to 2023, only 48 of them were for gaming purposes. That's 1.1%. Others claim that trust land is undermining states' tax base. Again, this is false. Trust land is like all other federal pieces of land, like military bases or national parks uh, that are not subject to state taxation. Impact aid and payments in lieu of taxes address these shortfalls. In reality, trust land is only 8.75% of the total federal land base. At the end of the day, there's no reason to oppose the carcieri fix legislation. In fact, Chairman Westerman and Chairman Hagerman uh, if Congress fails to act, the standards set forth in Carcieri versus Salazar will continue to undermine tribal sovereignty and devastate economic development uh, in Native and non-Native communities. Resolving any ambiguity in the tribe's ability to put land into trust, no matter when they were federally recognized, is vital to protecting tribal interests and avoiding costly and protracted litigation. I truly believe this legislation, as well as H.R. 6160, introduced my good friend, uh, with my good friend uh, from Alabama um, and fellow appropriator, Mr. Carl, are vital to preserving many Native American communities. And I appreciate the opportunity to testify in favor of both these bills. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Chairman Cole, thank you for being here today. We appreciate your input and your insight into these important issues. The chair will now recognize the Honorable Marshall P. Reed for five minutes. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, Ch Chair Hegeman, Ranking Member Leger, Fernandez, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the privilege and honor for me to testify today in support of H.R. 1208. I am Worship Reed, Chairman of the Tunica Biloxi Tribe of Louisiana. The Supreme Court's ruling in Cartier v. Salazar cast doubt on the sovereign control of tribal lands and slowed the federal government's ability to place land into trust for the benefit of tribal governments. This not only harms the ability of tribes to provide for the welfare of their tribal citizens, but it also limits the ability of tribes to bring the benefits of their economic development activities to their non-tribal neighbors. Until Congress amends the Indian Reorganization Act in such a way as to correct the problems created by the Cartier decision, the successes and benefits brought on by strong tribal governments will continue to be significantly diminished. After a long history of injustice, the Tunica Biloxi tribe and hundreds of other tribes across the country are utilizing their own resources to purchase land that has been stolen from them. But we don't seek to continue the cycle of mistrust, envy, and hard feelings. Instead, we have forged new positive relationships with the local non-tribal communities that have grown up around us. The Tunica Biloxi Tribe has created several economic development enterprises on our trust land. Because we do not have a tax base to supply the revenue necessary to, to provide governmental services to our people, 
We operate these businesses to generate revenue for our tribal government. Using this revenue, we protect and enhance the welfare and culture of our tribal citizens and their families. These tribal businesses also provide major benefits for our non-tribal neighbors and revenues for our state and local governments in the region. Our modest tribal enterprises purchase over $10 million per year from local non-tribal vendors and supply wages in excess of $26 million per year to our mostly non-tribal employees. This payroll generates state and federal employment taxes and increase the local sales and property tax base. In addition, we have donated over $7 million to local charities and have contributed over $30 million to help the local parish government cover the costs associated with the additional demands placed on the community from the increased economic activity. When the tribe began looking at gaming as a means for economic advancement in the early 1990s, unemployment rates in Avalos Parish were as high as 17%, almost twice the national average at the time. Overnight, we went from a surviving community to a thriving community. After our gaming facility opened in 1994, the unemployment rate in Avalos Parish to, has dropped to about the national average, home prices increased, new roads were paved, schools improved, parish government services expanded, and hundreds of new businesses sprung up in central Louisiana. We in any country are working hard to diversify our economies away from gaming and finding new enterprises that can provide the revenues we need to support our communities. We hope to create new manufacturing facilities, enter the software and service industries, and build new clean energy projects. However, we first must repurchase the land that was stolen from us in order to have a place to build these new economic development projects. After 30 years of operation of our gaming facility, our neighbors and state and local government partners have come to realize that our success is a big contributor to their success. For the record, I would like to submit letters and proclamations from the state of Louisiana and several local area governments recognizing the benefit of our economic development activities to their own success and prosperity. The Supreme Court decision in Cartier was a major step backward in the walk towards justice as well as healing. The ruling confused both tribal governments and non-Indians alike, slowed economic growth and job creation, and continued to spawn legal challenges to the recovery of our ancestral homelands for the good of the tribe, for the good of Indian children and generations yet to come, and for the good of our non-Indian neighbors and the entire nation, Congress should act to pass H.R. 1208 to amend the Indian Reorganization Act to conform to this original intended purpose. Thank you for your time and consideration and attention to this matter. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Stephanie Bryan for five minutes. Good morning, Chair Hageman, Ranking Member Ligler Fernandez, and Chairman Cole, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Stephanie Bryan, and I am honored to serve as the Chair and CEO for the Porch Band of Creek Indians, located in Lower Alabama. We appreciate this opportunity to testify, but most importantly, we thank Congressman Jerry Carl for introducing this bill. We also thank the counties and cities that border our trust lands for their partnership and support. The Porch Band of Creek Indians has been leading a leading advocate to clarify that the Indian Reorganization Act applies to all federally recognized tribes. We offer our full support of Chairman Cole's bill, H.R. 1208, which would accomplish this goal. We will continue to work to pass a national fix, but our tribe is taking a parallel approach by working with our congressional delegation to clarify that the IRA applies to our tribe. For decades, porch leaders have balanced the desire to preserve our tribe's history and culture with the need to rebuild our community and provide basic services to our citizens. Today, we're blessed to be able to provide our tribal citizens and neighbors with essential services that include police, 
fire protection, health care, elder care, education, and infrastructure. We've made careful decisions about how best to use our resources and property, but we have limited trust lands and we can't meet the growing needs for housing and other basic services for our citizens. For example, in 2018, it became clear that we needed to expand our Boys and Girls Club. There was no more buildable trust land, and we were forced to fill ponds around the community center on existing trust lands, which added $1 million to our construction cost. We're not alone. Tribal governments nationwide have a shortage of usable trust land and seek to acquire trust lands to serve their citizens. The Supreme Court's decision, 2009 Cartier decision, upended the Interior Department's land into trust process. That decision placed a cloud of uncertainty over tribal trust lands, impeding investment and in economic development in Indian country. These lawsuits have cost American taxpayers a significant amount of money. The Interior Department and DOJ have had to defend not only our trust lands, but also the lands of other tribes. The tribe alone has spent more than 10 million $10 million to defend ourselves from legal challenges attacking the status of our trust lands. Thankfully, every court reviewing these frivolous cases against us has upheld the status of our lands which the Interior Department placed in trust decades ago. However, these lawsuits have taken a real toll and that's why our tribe is seeking a legislative solution that will provide us with much needed certainty. The bill affirms that the IRA applies to our tribe and brings us into parity with other federally recognized tribes. This bill has strong support from the Alabama congressional delegation and the cities and counties that surround us. I respectfully ask the full committee to mark up H.R. 6180 and please pass this bill this year. On behalf of our tribe, I'm honored to speak to you today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mado. Thank you, Ms. Bryan. The chair now recognizes the Honorable David Rabbit for five minutes. <clears throat> chair Hegman, thank you very much. Uh, Ranking Member Ledger Fernandez, thank you as well, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. My name is David Rabbit. I am an elected supervisor from Sonoma County, California, and current chair. The testimony that I am delivering is on behalf of the National Association of Counties, or NACO, which represents America's 3,069 counties, rep uh, nearly 40,000 uh, county elected officials, and over 3.6 million county employees. I am an active member of NACO, formerly serving on its board of directors, and have been the leading voice in county uh, in tribal relations. Uh, incidentally, I am from Sonoma County, a, a county that has five federally rec recognized tribes. Uh, sixth uh, is also looking to move into the county. Three of those tribes currently operate casinos, two within the county, one within the Bay Area. But I will say this, that we have agreements with all five of our federally recognized tribes, and that's what I'm here today to, uh, to hope that you also agree that that is a great way to go forward. Uh, Counties play, as you know, a critical role in everyday life of uh, residents, of the nation's residents, strong intergovernmental partners, county support, government to government relations that recognize the unique role and interests of tribes, state, counties, and other local governments, all uh, to protect uh, the members of our communities. Uh, it is incumbent upon Congress to fix the longstanding syst systemic defects in the Department of the Interior's broken fee to trust process. And to be clear, we believe that any Cartieri fix or any legislation that would restore the Interior Secretary's authority to take land into trust for tribes must be coupled with much needed long overdue reforms in the federal government's deeply flawed trust land decision-making process. And unfortunately, the so-called clean Cartieri fix 
would do nothing to repair the underlying problems in the trust land system and would only serve to exasperate and perpetuate the inherent conflict and fundamental flaws of the current process, a process, incidentally, that is broken for all parties, tribes, and local governments. Ex existing federal laws and regulations simply fail to address the off-reservation impacts of tribal land development, including casinos, and particularly in those instances when local land use and health and safety regulations Trust acquisitions often increase demands for county, uh, critical county services and resources such as law enforcement, fire protection, transportation, and water without providing any mitigation for these impacts. Not only is mitigation ignored in the fee to trust process, a county's capacity to address the impacts is reduced by eliminating the land from the local tax base. Nonetheless, Although uh, trust acquisitions often result in significant off-reservation impacts, the Department of the Interior does not provide impacted local governments and communities with sufficient notice or meaningful opportunity to comment regarding fee-to-trust applications. Furthermore, the Department does not accord county concerns in off-reservation uh, off impacts adequate weight in the land-to-trust process. The federal process is also flawed in that it does not provide an avenue for tribes to engage in good faith discussions regarding mitigation of environmental impacts of tribal development, nor is there any incentive for tribes to enter into mitigation agreements with local governments. It should be noted that an approach that encourages the intergovernmental agreements between tribes and local governments affected by fee to trust applications is required and working well under recent California state gaming compacts. Again, in Sonoma County, we entered into a comprehensive intergovernment agreement to create an over 500-acre homeland for the Lytton Band of Pomo Indians and supported legislation by Congressman Huffman to take that land into trust. Not only does uh, uh, such a collaborative F, uh, approach offer the opportunity to streamline the application process, it can also help us ensure that success of the tribal project within the local community. The establishment of a trust land system that incentivizes intergovernmental agreements between tribes and local governments is at the heart of NACO's fee to trust reform recommendations. I'd uh, like to take just a few minutes to talk about that further. I can tell you personally, I'm, I'm an architect by profession. I'm in, involved in, therefore involved in development, and every development has an impact. And every development has an impact, an offsite impact, especially as the smaller pieces of land lands that are uh, where that development occurs. And it's incumbent upon the developer or the applicant or the owner of that property to make sure that they're mitigating those impacts to the best extent possible. You can't eliminate everything, but you certainly can mitigate it. And I think if you don't, what you end up doing is pushing that can down the road. And, uh, and unfortunately, I think what we've seen in the past is that many times leads to litigation. Some people think by having these intergovernmental agreements beforehand that that would delay a process. I personally believe, and by evidence with our experiences in our county, uh, believe that actually it would uh, speed the process because you would eliminate the chances of having litigation in the future over things that weren't transparent or fully explained prior. I think it's really just sitting down with each other like most things are, communicating with one another, understanding what we totally understand and respect the sovereignty of the tribal nations. Uh, we can't dictate what is gonna be built on those properties, but we can talk about how people will come and go from those properties. We can talk about what water will be used for those properties. We can talk about how the fire services, the law enforcement services, and so on and so forth. And I very much appreciate uh, the board's willingness to hear me out today, and certainly uh, there is more within the written testimony. Thank you very much. Thank we you. appreciate your comments and your insight, <clears throat> as well as your personal experience. I will now recognize members for five minutes of questioning, and I will start with me. Um, since the Cartieri decision was issued in 2009, it has been unclear how many tribes could be affected by that decision. And I think for policymakers, it is helpful to know the breadth of this particular problem. So I'm going to direct this question to uh, Ms. Isom Claus. Does the department know how many federally recognized tribes would not be considered, quote, under federal jurisdiction pursuant to the Cartieri decision? Thank you for the question, Chair Hageman. Uh, we look at these tribe by tribe, so you know we don't have kind of one centralized list that would have all of that. It's a very um, 
fact-intensive and specific dive into the complicated history of the relationship. So even between... after 15 years, you, the, the uh, department has not yet determined how many of our 574 recognized tribes would be impacted by this decision? Well, I would also say all tribes are impacted by this decision because every tribe is required to go through this analysis. Some may have kind of more clear facts and some have more complicated facts, but there's always an expansion of government resources, tribal resources, risk of litigation. So everyone is impacted. Um, some have more complicated histories that take longer to wade through. Okay. What type of land into trust applications tend to draw the most concern or opposition? Well, as I think, um, you know, we've, we've heard uh, from the supervisor that um, gaming applications uh, tend to draw more concern, but I will note that the majority of fee trust applications are on reservation, non-controversial. And it's okay. only tiny, you know, one to three percentage at most are gaming. But you would agree that the gaming projects are the ones that tend to be the most controversial? In some cases, they are. And when there are comments, there's additional review process. I want to separate out the fee to trust process and gaming, because the fee to trust process is an entirely <coughs> separate process. If a tribe wants to take um, land and trust for gaming, there's a separate process to go through to determine whether that land, is, that land is eligible for gaming. That's another comment period. There's another NEPA review. So the fee to trust process um, is you know, one opportunity for comment. The gaming process is an, is an entirely different one. And Mr. Rabbit, I'd like to follow up on the testimony that you were providing near the end there. You mentioned the success of intergovernmental mitigation agreements in California related to gaming compacts. Can you expand on how this approach has been beneficial? Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, we have uh, five agreements. We have agreements with all uh, five within our uh, county. There's one within my district, the Grayton, uh, Federated Grayton uh, Tribe Rancheria, uh, with a, relative, a, a large casino. But prior to that casino and that land being taken into trust, we did have an agreement with the tribe to identify certain uh, known impacts, transportation for instance, and there was a, uh, an agreement with our local transportation authority to make sure that we had access to the property. Groundwater was a concern. Uh, residents around the uh, site had very shallow wells and you know, spotty uh, groundwater. Uh, so we have an independent third party uh, folks come in to mon monitor that groundwater to make sure there's no um, impacts in the future. But it's just those kind of things that we, we put in place prior that made for a much smoother process and uh, quite honestly alleviated the concerns around the neighborhood and I think made the project uh, that much more successful. Okay, so you would agree that with these kind of a mitigation agreements, it tends to allow for the process to move forward more quickly as the community itself can understand what the benefits may be. That has always been my experience. And again, as an architect, I can tell you that if uh, someone's going through and wanting to build something that everyone is up in arms with, you're more likely to have a slower process. Uh, you're more likely to end up in uh, litigation than if you go through and actually meet with people prior and, and come to an agreement about what that should be. What happens in those circumstances when a mitigation agreement cannot be reached between a tribe and a local government? Yeah, we totally think that there should be a secretarial de determination uh, to make sure that those impacts were proper, properly mitigated. We just want to be part of that conversation. We want to have that opportunity, and we think it needs to be a meaningful uh, time frame to make sure that we can, uh, you know, opine and run that by all the different uh, districts, perhaps, that are also going to be uh, putting services forward. For instance, in the casino that I mentioned, law enforcement was not part of the tribe's uh, purview, nor was the uh, fire department. So those, those were important agreements to get into place prior to having thousands and thousands of people on a piece Just of property. Just very, very quickly, the Department of Interior recently updated its Part 151 regulations governing the fee-to-trust process. Do the revisions address any of the issues that counties and localities have raised about the fee to trust process over the years? As quickly as I can, I would say no. Okay. <clears throat> I will now recognize uh, the ranking member for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, Chairman uh, Pierrit and uh, Chair Brian, I want to ask a couple of questions about the fact that uh, there are issues that were raised uh, about 
the importance of communication and collaboration and input. Uh, can I ask each of you if in the fee to trust applications you've engaged in, did, did you go through those kinds of uh, interactions and feedback with, with local governments and with interested parties? Uh, Chair, uh, we'll start with Chair, uh, Chair Brian. So, um, yes, we've actually engaged with um, those counties. Anytime, they have a comment period to go through um, if you put land in a trust. So they have an opportunity to voice their concerns um, or any questions they may have. But I will tell you that from our experience, we've almost given back $37 million <laughs> um, to local communities. We know what it's like not to have much, so it's important for us to give back. And you know, it's always been a goal for me as a leader to work collaboratively together with the counties, the cities, and the state, because we're part of those communities. And if we work collaboratively together, um, and we have MOUs with the various counties, and we also have their support of Montgomery County, Elmore County, Escambia County, the cities where we're located. So we've definitely improved that communication and that ability to um, work with okay. the surrounding areas. Thank you, Chairman Pirit. And yes, Tunica Biloxi went through the same process, but early on we established the uh, collaboration as well as cooperation and having uh, understanding on what gaming will br bring to not only uh, Tunica Biloxi, but of all parish as well as central Louisiana, the jobs that we create. And as well as uh, this is not a, only about developing uh, understanding about job creations, it's about providing hope. They're providing a purpose, not only for the tribal community, but for the overall community. And developing and building that understanding we done at a very early stage. And um, our relationship with Central Louisiana, uh, the non-tribal community is part of our extended family and vice versa. Thank you, and I think that the, the letters of support that you've submitted uh, exemplify that. And I think it's really important that these issues, though, are not, the bills we are talking about today aren't about what the process should be. If I'm understanding it, the bills we are talking about is that your two tribes and all the 548 tribes should be treated equally. Right? Is, is, is that how you see the bills that we are addressing today, that you want to be able to go through the same process as every other tribe when you're seeking to take land into trust? Chairman. Yes, ma'am, that is accurate. We are in support of a full culture every fix for all 574 tribal governments. And as well as the uh, acts, the Congress not to put an emphasis on the 1% that is uh, for the gaming, and uh, that's land to trust for gaming, but the 99%, that's what the emphasis should be on. That's what the focus should be on, because that 99% is can be uh, uh, to but utilized for advanced manufacturing, for textiles. So if you look at the lay of the land over the last 30 years, Tuna Kovalexi just celebrated 30 years in gaming. But at the same time, during the 30 years, over 11.2 million jobs, advanced manufacturing jobs, left the United States. Okay. Thousands of textile jobs left the United States. Tribes can bring them back. Thank you, and I think that both uh, of the tribal leaders' testimony today, which is, I think, the most important ones that we must listen to, actually emphasize the need uh, uh, to take into land for other purposes and that this addresses that. Uh, 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 Ms. Catherine isom Claus and I was just out in Taos and meeting with Taos Pueblo. Uh, will the passage of this bill change the, any of the laws regarding and regulations regarding land and the trust for gaming? Thank you for your visit to Taos Pueblo. First of all, I'm glad you were able to be there. Um, no. This will not change any of the fee to trust applica application. It's only a threshold question of whether the secretary has authority to take land into trust for a tribe. If so, then we can proceed through the entire regulatory 
process that takes time. And, and I've run out of time, but I wanted to just get this $10 million for just one tribe on litigation. Will the passage of these bills save the department money? Yes. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Carl for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Uh, Chairwoman Bryant, three quick questions. It's rapid fire here, so get ready. Uh, I keep hearing gaming popping up here. Are we talking about gaming on, on, our, on our bill that we're looking at, 6180? Um, absolutely not. This is about parity and all tribes being tr treated equally, actually. Um, I, I think as the interior stated, there's IGRA that you can go through for the gaming process. And we heard from um, the champion on this um, Cartieri fix, Congressman Cole, that, that it's, it's about 1% that's to do with gaming or right. less than 1%. So this is not to do with gaming. So uh, when you look at Porch Creek, I have been a county commissioner for eight years. So I understand the per permitting process. I understand your developments on, on the properties that we're talking about here. I just want to say it's always first class. Y'all are a five-star Michelin group. I, everything y'all do is first class or not at all. What y'all do for our community is priceless. And I'm not talking about just community. I'm talking about the entire state. Most people don't realize how many different companies actually have sprung from a, a, a simple group of folks uh, in Atmore, Alabama, that has remained simple, and I think that's very important. Uh, they have not forgotten everyone in the process. Could you elaborate on how the Porch Creek Bill will enhance the tribal's ability to serve the community? It would actually give us the ability to, um, you know, place land into trust for housing, for a nursing home to take care of our elders who sacrificed um, all those years that didn't have much. And so that would allow us an opportunity to meet the demanding needs of our community going forward. And y'all do an incredible job. I came and saw the Boys and Girls Club situation two years ago, three years ago. And of course, I've been there for, for, the, uh, uh, for several, several situations. That service is over 500 children and only 10% are tribal members. So yeah. it services the community. Um, not just the Porch Band of Creek Indians. And Atmore is a very small community. It, it, it truly is the city of Atmore itself. And I, I know how you work with the county commission and the city there. Uh, can you discuss the relationships the tribe has developed with the county bordering the trust lands, which would be Mobile County, obviously Scambia County, Washington County? Absolutely. Um, we've given to the counties, um, you know, Financially, um, we have MOUs with them. Um, but most importantly, we collaborate together to use our tribal dollars along with the county dollars to help with infrastructure, to maintain roads, build roads. Um, we have a great relationship with the counties. And, and I will tell you this, um, the letter of support that the counties that's a part of um, the written a testimony, you will see that those counties are so grateful and appreciative because we do help provide um, fire protection, um, drug task force. We support the drug task force. Um, we're also working with them on some issues that all of America's facing, which is mental issues. We're actually um, in the process of helping build, um, hopefully, a rural hospital. We're trying to collaborate together to build a rural hospital um, because the old one is, you know, maintenance fees are so exorbitant. So um, we're in the process of actually um, working to do those types of things within, the, within our communities and counties. So just for the record, I've been working with the county commission there in Scambia County. We, we were going to replace a bridge that, that Porch Creek stepped up. They're going to actually put the money up with a little bit of help, I hope. Uh, from 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 my folks, but we were able to shift that county money that was earmarked for that actually to another road project. So I know the county's happy; they should be. <laughs> and, and our rural health care in America as a whole is horrible. But I, again, I know Porch Creek well enough. They're not going to let the 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 uh, health in, in that area go down. And, and we do have some problems there, and of course the whole county. So I appreciate any help you can you y'all can willing to step up on the on the healthcare portion with the hospitals. 
With that, Madam Chair, I return back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carl. The chair now recognize Representative uh, Radawagon for five minutes of questioning. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I would uh, like to uh, yield my time over to the chairwoman. Thank you. I'd like to get into a bit more detail about the nature of the Cartier fix that we're talking about. And I'd like to direct my questions to Chairman Pirit as well as Tribal Chair Ms. Bryant. Um, Mr. Uh, 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 Chairman uh, Pirit, do you think legislatively reforming the fee to trust process along with a Cartier fix would benefit both tribes and local communities? And if so, how? It would benefit both tribes, but the act today is for legislative fix, for a cultural fix for all tribes. And I don't want to be on record leaving any tribes behind. Everything we do, we have to do as a family because, yes, we are 574 distinct tribes, individually tribes, but we are one tribal family. We are one Indian country. And by having a clean culture every fix, it will allow us to, uh, to simplify the process of getting land into trust. And bringing land into trust uh, allow us to get ahead of the game as far as economic opportunities. I mentioned before about uh, the United States being the greatest country in the world. But the biggest assets of the, uh, in the United States is the 574 tribal governments. Because those 574 tribal governments working together with a united effort can bring manufacturing back to this great country. And again, I mentioned 11.2 million jobs has migrated over the last 30 years. And we have not only positioned ourselves to fill that gap, but what is, again, it's not only about job creation, it's about building hope for the next generation. It is also about establishing passion, establishing purpose, aligning purpose for our next generation of workers. They, they have purpose for it to become who they choose to do. Uh, to become by creating that hope, that belief, and that dream, and having the ability to put the land into trust, having the ability to work with Congress, work with the local uh, as well as state agencies to provide economic opportunities for all, not just for tribal, uh, for tribal employees or tribal But citizens. for the local communities as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And Ms. Bryan, could you please address my question as to whether the uh, reforming the fee to trust process along with the Cartier fix, how would that benefit both tribes and the local communities? I, I do want to be clear that the Porch Band of Creek Indians, um, we have been very supportive of a national fix for 15 years <laughs> since since the decision was made, okay? And we are very supportive and we will continue to be very supportive, but Congress has passed bills that address um, certain tribes. So we took the parallel approach to do a porch specific bill because the national fix continues to get stalled <laughs> Um, and hasn't passed for 15 years. So that's the reason why, so this is nothing new to Congress. They've passed individual bills before for, for tribes. So we decided that now that we have the support of our Alabama delegation and all the great things that we're doing, we've created over, um, we've diversified our portfolio with over 40 different companies that has nothing to do with gaming. And so we've been afforded those opportunities because we have worked with our state, we've created jobs with NASA, um, have contracts with NASA, Department of Defense. So we just want to remove the cloud that is over the tribe of uncertainty because of the Cartier decision. So this will be very helpful for us um, to remove that cloud of uncertainty and um, provide you know, benefits that we need for our people. Okay, thank you. 
The chair now recognizes Jennifer Gonzalez Colon for her five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, everybody here. Um, Deputy Assistant Secretary, to what extent has the um, Carcieri decision increased the need for the department to defend uh, lying to trust decisions in the court? Thank you for the question. Um, we know that at least 12 federal court cases have been brought and over 20 cases before the Interior Board of Indian Appeals um, since the Carcieri decision. And as, as we know, federal court litigation can take years, maybe two years, maybe 10 years, and the IBIA also can take up to five years to issue a decision, which can then be appealed to federal court and uh, be another case <laughs> for us to litigate. Have the uh, tribes reported to the department that they are facing more litigation challenges since this case? Yes, absolutely. And are there any concerns that HR 6180 or HR 1208 could lead into unintended consequences? Um, and what recommendation, if any, does the department have for either bill? Thank you for the question. Um, I, the Carcheri fix would restore the status quo that was working for 75 years, and it would be returning to settled expectations, so we don't foresee any consequences um, that would not be intended, but merely a settling of expectations again. And you don't have any recommendation for any of those bills? I'm sorry, what, for? You don't have any, uh, any other recommendation for any of those bills? Um, we just support, you know, the, both bills. And so no amendments to any of them? No, no, no amendments. Thank okay. you. Um, I was, I was reviewing, in, and I would like to know how the Department of Interior uh, sought to address um, the concerns of state and local governments who believe, whether rightly or wrongly, uh, that they do not have enough involvement in the land into trust application process. Um, well, as... As we've uh, mentioned here, we've recently gone through a rulemaking process with the 151 regulations. We received hundreds of comments on those, all of which were addressed as part of the process, and many were from states and local communities um, about our process. We've we made changes from the proposed rule to the final rule based on those comments. Um, we kept in a comment period, a notification and comment period, even for on-reservation acquisitions, just to ensure that everyone is able to be heard. Um, when they when they need to be. If those comments are submitted, we will consider them. I will have a question for um, so Mr. Supervisor Rabbit. Um, how will having more information upfront about the land acquisition application uh, will benefit both uh, tribes uh, and, and counties during the Part 151 process? I'm sorry, having more information? Yes. Oh, I think having more information and, and really having that communication is vitally important. And, and I do recognize that, and again, I've mentioned, made mention of my own county, that individual counties and individual tribes certainly do have excellent relationships. You've heard some of those examples here today. But unfortunately, it's not universal. And Congress does have a unique opportunity to fix a broken process uh, and encourage successful intergovernmental in, uh, mitigation agreements and I think also streamline the process. I th honestly, by fixing one word, I don't think you take care of half of the problem that's in front of you. And I do think that uh, our county is a good example of uh, having those relationships, having those intergovernmental uh, agreements in place and having successful projects and successful tribal projects because of it. You, you said in your testimony, um, mentioning that any legislation to restore the interior uh, secretary's authority, um, and, I, and I quote, uh, much needed long overdue reforms in the federal government, deeply flawed pro trust land decision uh, making process. Uh, could you elaborate on, on this and to discuss some of the proposals uh, you believe Congress should enact uh, to reform the land trust in process? I think part of that is um, some of the noticing requirements, even with the 151 changes that were made, of they're really not transparent. They really don't give enough notice. Um, we would, you know, we, we too need to uh, reach out, not just to the community, uh, but to the districts that might be involved, fire districts, uh, water districts, whomever they might be that might be impacted or affected by taking that land into trust. They should have an opportunity to 
provide some input on that and for the secretary to take that all into consideration. But with the short time period, the lack of transparency, counties are sometimes, honestly, the last to know. Um, and we just believe that we need to be at the table, uh, having a conversation, understanding what these impacts are all about. And I'll be honest, in our county, and I can't speak for all counties, and I know I'm here as an ACO representative, it's not always about the money. Uh, it's certainly, but you know, there, there are those services that still need to be provided. And there are the impacts that need to be mitigated. And the, and the two don't always go hand in hand, but they need to uh, be taken into consideration. We've had successful projects because we sat down and had those agreements beforehand. It's great that the tribes in our county volunteered to do that. But right now, there's no requirement for the tribes to sit down and do that, or for the counties for that matter. And we just think, here's an opportunity, and we've been saying this for 15 years as well, because we totally uh, accept the fact that the Cartsieri is a broken system, and it creates, unfortunately, two classes of tribes, and that's all wrong. Uh, we would love to see it fixed, but we would like to see it fixed with the additional conditions that really encourage that conversation, that collaboration, all the things that we talk about uh, that have happened, but just make sure that we can encourage that and have that be universal across the country. Thank you, Supervisor. My time expired. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes Chairman Cole for five minutes of questioning. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's very generous of you. And again, thank you for allowing me to participate in your hearing today. Um, Chairwoman uh, Brian, let me ask you, and you alluded to this, but I'm going to ask you to think a little more broadly. The total cost that the tribe has absorbed through the Carcieri, uh, since the Carcieri decision, in terms of obviously the cost of legal uh, representation, but also delayed projects, things that weren't done that could have been done. Do you have any kind of estimate for what that uh, has done to Porch Creek Nation? So um, I will tell you, I have um, with me um, our Attorney General. The $10 million that I, I shared with you is, you know, it's probably more than that, I would say, um, because of the hours that our Attorney General, I don't know how many hours she's logged, but we have several attorneys that in-house have had to work on this to take away from those resources that we needed to address internally for our tribal government, we had to pull our attorneys off and put them on these cases because it was bit that important to our tribe. And, you know, that $10 million, you know, every day, that's, that's what motivates me is helping people improve their quality of life and giving them opportunity, um, giving them the tools that they need and opportunity for advancement. And so that $10 million would have done so much um, for our community, it would have saved a lot of time from our legal department. We would have um, used that 10 mil. We're in the process of building a elder care center where we feed our elders um, lunch. So that $10 million could have done a lot um, for our members and our citizens. And these are costs you would not have had had it not been for the Carcieri decision. In other words, you weren't expending these kind of resources before that decision in 2009. No, sir, we were So wouldn't. that's why the system's broken, in my view, Madam Chair. It's really a court system that has caused, or a court decision that's caused the, the problem. It's and caused the federal government taxpayers' dollars, too, as well, because Department of, of Interior, Department of Justice, you know, they have to travel. They have to have attorneys work on it, travel to the 11th Circuit. And so it's costing tribes and the federal government a lot of money on these frivolous lawsuits. Let me go, if I may, to uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, uh, I hope I got it right, Issam Claus. Uh, uh, Ms. Issam Claus, could you, would you have a rough estimate of how many cases have been brought contesting uh, BIA trust acquisition approval because of carcieri? Yes, thank you for the question, Representative. Our our rough estimate is at least 12 federal court cases and over 20 cases before the IBIA have been brought since the Cartieri decision. And uh, when you get into one of these suits, and I know some of them are still ongoing, but how long does it take you to actually work through that and, and come to a settlement on average? 
at minimum two years. Uh, we know it's been up to 10 years in some cases, and that's in federal court. And in the IBIA, it can be up to five years for the court to issue a decision, which can then be followed by a challenge in federal district court if the administration or the, if the agency's decision is upheld. And is there any way you could tell us a sort of, okay, how did it work pre-carciary and post-carciary? How, how much more difficult, if it at all, made it for the department to come to uh, relatively speedy decisions in these matters? Sure. I mean, it's difficult to estimate exactly the time because it varies so much. But, um, you know, typically through the process, we go through title reviews, environmental reviews, regulatory reviews. And then we add on this extra layer of a legal review of whether a tribe is under a federal jurisdiction. So that's um, researching the tribe's history and documents, maybe going back to the tribe for more information, which can take some months to, to get through that process. And then, as you've mentioned, tacking on added litigation on the back end. I'm trying to remember, Madam, Secretary, or Madam Chair, and I'd need to, to check this out, but the Indian Reorganization Act, I think, listed some something fewer than 200 tribes that were recognized at the time. I, I recall it being more like 130. So if there's 570-odd tribes out there, we put a lot of people that for years had been moving land into trust, uh, operating under one set, and we and this was precedent that under Democrats and Republicans, you know, there was no difference. The, the secretary was moving along. So, you know, this is one where the Supreme Court really did throw a, a, a wrench in the in the work, so to speak, and uh, make it very difficult. I just want to end with this. I think you could multiply what these tribes have gone through dozens, if not hundreds of times, the other tribes have dealt with this. So, uh, you know, again, it wasn't broken before. I don't think we, this fixed it, it made it a lot worse. And just going back, and we can look at other things, but I think you ought to, we ought to look at restoring uh, what existed and worked before, uh, and did not cost tribes huge delays and millions of dollars worth of litigation. and. Uh, not to mention the uncertainty that comes when literally you're uh, you're contested as to whether or not your land is actually protected or not. Uh, with that, thank you again for the hearing. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Well, Chairman anyway. Cole, you make a compelling case, and your insight and history has been invaluable today. So thank you for thank being you. willing to join us. I know that you have other commitments, and in fact, I believe you're chairing another committee right now as we speak. <laughs> yes, so you're, you're kind of magical too, which is, <laughs> which is always nice. Um, the, the chair now recognizes uh, Chairman Westerman for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair, and the witnesses, and also want to thank my friend Chairman Cole for taking time out of a very, very busy schedule this week. We've got three appropriation bills on the floor, but you know this issue is important to him because he took time to come over to the Natural Resources Committee and to, to be involved, as he's been very involved all along. Um, this awesome clause, over the past decade, there have been some, some that have questioned whether there are standards or limits on the Secretary's authority to place land and trust pursuant to the Indian Reorganization Act. In previous years, the administration has pointed to its 151 regulations. So my question to you, are there statutory limits on the Secretary's authority to place land into trust for tribes? Uh, well, so the, the IRA, of course, authorizes the secretary to take land into trust. Um, it's, it's not a limit, but an authorization. And then our regulations provide the guidelines of all of the factors that need to be met in terms of documentation and legal reviews and regulatory reviews. Um, so that kind of provides our limits and how we look at applications. But, but can't regulations change from administration to administration? And aren't these really self-imposed regulations? Yes, they, they can change, um, and the department issues the regulations. So, so yes, we pose them on ourselves. So what, what's the, so, so could the department change the regulations and, and do a better job now than what's being done? Or do you think there needs to be a, a bigger fix by Congress for the department to be able to do their job correctly? Thank you for, for the question. You know, our testimony today is focused on Kacheri, which is um, 
you know, we hope it can be separated from the land and trust process by just kind of knocking out this threshold question of the secretary's authority. We did just go through a process to update our, um, CF, our 25 CFR Part 151 regulations, um, which has taken place over the last few years. Um, it's involved many tribal consultations and public comment periods, many, many comments that we received from um, local communities and states and tribes, um, and we, we did our best in taking that all into account and trying to streamline the process and make it more efficient and better overall for tribes. Talking about making it more efficient, how are concerns from states and local communities taken into consideration during the land to trust process? Um, states and local communities are given 30 days of notice and opportunity to comment, and any of those comments that are submitted are taken into account as part of the application. I guess that can be a, a broad range of comments and issues. Um, are there requirements for the department to take local concerns about zoning, land use, or other similar issues into consideration? Yes, um, yes, uh, that's specifically part of the regulations that we do take that into consideration. Um, and you know, again, the vast majority of, of land and into trust applications are not controversial. They're often on reservation consolidating tribal land holdings. So kind of clarifying jurisdiction and making tribal governance simpler because it's um, consolidating their tribal homelands and can make jurisdictional boundaries a little clearer. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Rabbit, the department is supposed to provide notice to impacted state and local governments when fee to trust applications are submitted. In your experience, what has this actually looked like in practice? Uh, honestly, a fire drill. Uh, 30 days uh, is a very short period of time. And again, it's not just the county proper itself, uh, because it's also the, those districts that serve that land. Um, so then we have to reach out to those districts in order to get them to be able to give feedback. Uh, like you, we're a public body and we need to take that in information back, uh, not just from staff, but actually from the public. Uh, it's their land as well at, at that point in time and, and getting that information back from the boards of those different districts. So 30 days is, in my opinion, and I think in the county's opinions, is woefully inadequate. We would love to see something more like 120. And I think it's one of those things where you uh, go slow to go fast that you actually will have a better project long term if you make sure that you compile all the comments thoughtfully and not just rushed in and boilerplated down or uh, comments that may go above and beyond even the scope of the project, but just wanting to cover uh, those topics. I do think in, I think 30 days is just inadequate, um, 120, 90, whatever, whatever can be more reasonable in terms of getting that information would be beneficial. Almost seems like a process where the department moves slow but wants everybody else to move fast. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for a UC request. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, thank you. I ask unanimous consent to submit into the record the Department of the Interior's new land acquisition regu regulations, which I would note were developed over a year of seeking input from state, local, and tribal governments. So ordered, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I ask <clears throat> unanimous consent to enter into the record the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, uh, which sets the standards for conducting gaming on tribal lands, just to clarify that that is indeed a separate uh, standard and separate from the issue of whether all tribes should be uh, treated with parity in this process. So ordered, thank you, without objection. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for your valuable testimony, and I also want to thank the members and those folks who waved on today and joined us for your questioning as well. This is an important issue that I think we need to be addressing these long-term challenges and see if we can find some resolution for all of our tribes. Uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond to these in writing if they are submitted. Under committee rule three, members of the committee must submit such questions to the committee clerk by 5 p.m. on Monday, July 1st, 2024, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days for these responses. If there is no further business, without objection, the committee stands adjourned.